Thank you, Mark, and uh, Happy New Year. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been in the book of First Thessalonians, and so we are back to our study, and midway through the book, we're looking at 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 11 through 13, which is a brief passage. It's a prayer by the apostle, right, right here in the middle of the book. And uh, while it's brief, it's a passage that's filled with um, theology and practical application that we could spend a lot of time on. So, three verses, beginning with verse 11. Now may our God and Father Himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together. In a word of prayer. David Brainerd was a missionary to the Indians on the frontier of colonial America. He was a man of intense prayer. He could be found kneeling in the snow for hours, weeping and crying out to God to save the Indians for whom he had brought the gospel. I mention that because our passage is a prayer for the Thessalonians. And though it is given in just three verses, it has the earnestness of Brainerd's prayers. All of Paul's prayers did. They were not routine litanies, but heartfelt petitions to God to act and to help. Later in chapter 5, Paul says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. There's a connection between joy and prayer. There's no joy in life without prayer in life. Paul knew prayer was essential for growth and spiritual success. So he, like Brainerd, was in it continually. I mentioned Brainerd also because he was a Calvinist. And his life gives the lie to the commonly held idea that belief in the absolute sovereignty of God precludes prayer and prevents evangelism. In a sermon, Charles Spurgeon said that every Arminian is a Calvinist when he prays. That's true. If God is not absolutely sovereign, why pray? We pray only because He is sovereign, because He's in absolute control of things. Paul would have agreed with all of that. He demonstrates it in his prayer here in 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 11 through 13. He was halfway through his letter when he he paused to pray. In fact, it's characteristic of him to do that, to slip into a short prayer during his letters. For example, he did that in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. Who but the sovereign God could do that, do far more abundantly than even we ask or think? Who but a sovereign God could save the Indians or the white man? Brainerd knew he couldn't, not with his weak body racked with tuberculosis, coughing up blood into the snow as he prayed. And Paul knew that only God could change the Thessalonians, that's why he looked to the Lord to do that. He prayed three things in this three-verse prayer. First, that God would make it possible for him to visit them. Second, that he would give the Thessalonians spiritual growth. And third, that they would be found blameless when Christ returns. I titled this a Calvinist's prayer, not to be provocative, but to emphasize that God is sovereign, and because He is, He does amazing things in our lives. So it makes sense to pray to Him. 
But also, it only makes sense for a Calvinist to pray to him. Now, Paul has been telling the Thessalonians how much he loved them and desired to see them. More than once he had tried to do that, but Satan had hindered him. He speaks of that back in chapter 2. And that was genuine. That was a genuine desire he had and a genuine effort he had made. He's just said in verse 10 that they prayed, he and Timothy and Silas and the others prayed night and day and most earnestly that they might see their face and help complete their faith. Then in verse 11, he slips into his prayer for that very thing. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. Now we could easily spend the rest of the hour on this verse alone, this brief verse 11 alone, because of what it reveals about God's nature. He is a trinity. And that is a very clear implication of verse 11. He is a trinity, and he is personal, and he is sovereign. All of that is contained in verse 11. Now, none of that is Paul's point. That's not, that's not what he is trying to teach here. He wasn't giving a lesson on theology, but it, it shows how informed his thinking was by great doctrine and, and why he could pray as confidently as he did. He had great doctrine in his thinking and behind his prayer. He prayed to both God the Father and the Lord Jesus because Jesus is Lord as much as the Father is God. He prayed to both of them because both are God. That's Trinitarian. And that's supported from the grammar because the verb is singular. It is literally, may He direct our way to you. Paul prayed to both persons that they would direct them. But both persons are contained in the single subject of the verb, indicating that the unity of the Godhead. That is Trinitarian theology, which is clear from the fact that Paul prays to both, and from the title of Lord that indicates Jesus' deity. But then also from the singular verb for a plural subject. That's the nature of God, who is one. There's only one God, not three gods, one God who exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God is a trinity. Now that word trinity, of course, is not found in the Bible, and that is often the uh, objection that is made to the doctrine by those who don't believe it. It's from Latin, it's not from Greek. The word is theological. It explains a theological concept. But it's verses like this one that led to the formulation of the doctrine. It is the only way to understand the revelation of God of His nature, to understand the work of God in salvation, and, and the descriptions that the Bible gives of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's mystery in this concept. We can't explain it fully. I could devote the rest of the hour to verse 11 and still barely touch upon this great doctrine. It is mysterious. It is beyond us. In fact, J.I. Packer wrote, it is perhaps the most difficult thought that the human mind has ever been asked to handle. It is not easy, but it is true. We'll spend all eternity learning about it, going deeper and deeper into the being of God and never come to the end of it. For all eternity, its unfathomableness shouldn't surprise us, though. God is infinite. We're not. And so how do you reach the end of the infinity of anything? And only God is infinite. So no, we'll spend all eternity learning about this great doctrine, but we know enough about it to know that it's true. But what an encouragement it is to know this, to know 
that God, the three in one, exists, and He's for us. That's indicated here in the description of God, the first person of the Trinity, as Father, which tells us that God is personal. That reveals much about God's nature, that He cares for us like a father. A father begins the relationship with his children through generation. And God did that with every believer, brought us into existence spiritually as well as physically. But a father is far more than a progenitor. He is also a provider. A father raises his children, guides them, and protects them. He enjoys his relationship with them. And God does that with us. In fact, that's how Jesus defines eternal life in John 17, 3. This is eternal life, he said, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So it, 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 eternal life is essentially, Jesus says, basically a relationship. Us with God, God with us. And that's what God wants. Not like a, a lonely person who wants companionship. God was never lonely. God is three in one. He had perfect fellowship within the Godhead. That's the interesting and practical aspect of the Trinity. God was never lonely. In perfect harmony and fellowship within himself. He wants that relationship with us because he loves us. And the relationship is best for us. Uh, why he loves us is a mystery every bit as great as the mystery of the Trinity. We are his creation, true, and so one might say, well, that's why he loves us, because he created us. And there's some truth in that, but we're fallen. And he set his love upon a wrecked and ruined race that has nothing to offer him but a, a clenched fist and rebellion. Still, he chose us and purchased us with his son's blood, and he brought us into a relationship. We are not just his associates. Now, to be his associate is quite a privilege. In fact, you go back to the Old Testament, and one of the greatest titles given to a person is servant. Moses was a servant of the Lord. Joshua was a servant of the Lord. There's no greater title than that. And we are that if we're his people. We are his servants. And the Apostle Paul owned that. And what a blessing it was. But we're more than servants. We are his sons and daughters. Now that is an amazing thing. To, to be related to God Almighty, the triune God, in such a personal way, in such a personal relationship. He will never abandon us. We are his children. He invites us, in fact, into his counsel. We, we, we know things that the world does not know. We know the basic things of life and the most important things of life. We have been brought into his counsel, and he gives us that counsel through his word, through scripture. That's why it is so important that we be in the word of God, in the Bible, daily. We emphasize that. Emphasize that, I think, probably last week uh, when we considered the new year. We're to be men and women of the Word of God, of the Scriptures. And, and He encourages us to pray continually to Him, to, to enter into verbal fellowship with Him and seek His help and to, get, to ask for, his, for the wisdom that only He can give and that comes to us through the Scriptures. It, it's all by grace we are sons and daughters by grace, by adoption. That's how Paul describes us in Romans 8 and verse 15. We have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear, he said, but a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And there's another sermon right there, Abba, Father. It's a way of saying we enter into the most personal, intimate relationship with God, the Father. Through the Spirit. We, we enter into God's family through faith alone, in Christ alone, on the basis of His sacrifice alone. He, he redeemed us in that way from under the law, Paul says in Galatians 4 verse 5, under, from under its condemnation and its bondage, so that we might receive the adoption as sons. 
And so because we as believers, every believer, male and female, are sons, that is, we all have sonship, because of that, we have an inheritance. In Romans 4, verse 13, Paul describes every believer as an heir of the world. We are strangers and aliens in this present world. If you read through the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, you see they were strangers and aliens, these patriarchs. And so are we. This world is not our home. This is not where our real citizenship is. We have a temporal kind of citizenship, that's true, but we are citizenship, citizens of heaven. And while we're presently aliens and strangers here, we will inherit the earth. The trials Paul experienced in this life that the Thessalonians were passing through that you and I may have are temporary. What is to come is permanent. That should encourage us to live faithfully as God's children, under His guidance and protection. All of that is here in this brief description of God as our God and Father. Is a, a significant statement for our understanding of the nature of God, that He is personal, that He is loving, that He seeks our good always, never our demise. And He's capable of that because He is our great sovereign God. Again, Paul was not giving a theological discourse on the Trinity any more than he was giving one on divine sovereignty. Now, this is a, a prayer and an expression of hope. It's based on these doctrines. These are, as Leon Morris said, incidental expressions that, that show Paul's basic thinking about God. They, they just come out, as it were. But what they show is what is assumed in his knowledge of God, assumed in his prayer for them. That, that God is triune, that He is personal, and He is sovereign. So Paul found it very natural to give Jesus the highest place with the Father to recognize His full deity by including Him in His prayer. And obviously the Thessalonians believed that too, since Paul didn't offer arguments to prove it. He didn't need to try to prove the Trinity and prove the deity of Christ to them. There was no need for that. The deity of Christ was held from the very beginning of the church. This is one of the first things that they believed when they came to a knowledge of Him. So Paul prays that the Father and Son would direct their way to them. And that has the idea of make straight his path to them. Make it possible. Remove all of the obstacles that, that would prevent them from getting back to Thessalonica. Again, only a sovereign God could do that. Only one who controls the hearts and the minds of men and the circumstances of life. That was only he could do that. That's what Paul prays in verse 12. Cause them to increase in and abound in love for one another. So he's praying that the sovereign God do that, that, that he allow them to return and that, that he would allow the Thessalonians and he would enable the Thessalonians to grow in their Christian life. That's his second request here, um, that they would increase and abound in love for one another. In verse 10, Paul prayed earnestly that, that he could come to them for that very purpose, that he could come in order to complete what was lacking in their faith. And he would do that through instruction and, and encouragement. He was doing that through the instruction and the encouragement of this letter, but he wanted to be there personally, to be able to spend time face to face with them and instruct them. But, but here it shows that their spiritual growth was ultimately in the hands of the Lord, not in the hands of the apostle. And there's no contradiction between the Lord being the one who blesses and the apostle being one who would bless too. God works through means and agents. Paul was his agent in blessing the Thessalonians. And it's always that way. He uses individuals, agents, you and me and others, to bless one another. He uses circumstances to do that. He uses things like 
the events of life. He uses the greatest means is the scriptures, the word of God, to sanctify us. And, and so Paul is praying that God would work in him to be a blessing to them. But ultimately, again, our growth comes from God. It's what Jesus taught in John 15, verses 1 through 6. He is the vine, and we are the branches. In him we receive his life and power, just like a branch can only grow and produce fruit if it's joined to the vine and the life of the vine. And, and so, too, we can only grow as we are joined to and connected to him. In fact, Jesus emphasizes that by saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. And probably it is Christ who is referred to here in the word Lord. And may the Lord cause you to increase. He's the nearest antecedent, uh, meaning he is the, the, the word closest to the word Lord in verse 11. So he's obviously speaking of Christ when he says in verse 11, and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you and may the Lord cause you to increase. Well, who's the Lord of verse 12? It's the Lord of verse 11. He's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ who would give them this growth that he's speaking of. Well, he does that, the Lord Jesus does that through the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who isn't referred to here. We haven't seen him yet, I don't think, in the book of 1 Thessalonians, but we will in chapter 4 and in chapter 5. He's the one who lives in us and does the work of sanctification, of transforming us into the image of Christ, which is another amazing truth as you reflect upon it, the third person of the Trinity, God the Spirit, dwells within each one of us who are believers. Paul develops that in, in Ephesians, that we're sealed with the Spirit. Twice he talks about that. We have the, the person of God within us, and he's the one that, that sanctifies. He's the agent of sanctification, the, the transformation into the, the image of Christ is um, what he produces, and it's seen most clearly in the love that we have for him and for others. And that's really Paul's request. He wants their love for each other to increase and abound. Now, those two words are synonyms. He could have used just one of them. He could have spoken of increasing or abounding, but he uses both of them, which mean the same thing, but, but the reason he puts them together is to emphasize very clearly the point that he's making, that he wanted them to grow greatly in love. He wanted them to, to fill up with love and overflow with love. The reason is, this is the greatest of the Christian virtues. Paul said that, in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. Now faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Love is not merely an emotion, not mainly an emotion. It is active. It, it seeks the other person's best. That's how Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5. It does not seek its own. It is selfless. Those who love have a special regard for others, especially for the, the brethren, for other Christians. That discourages cliques and rivalries of the kind that the Corinthian church was dealing with. In fact, it's the reason Paul probably wrote that great chapter, chapter 13 on love, because that's what they needed to hear. We're to love and embrace all, and it, it, it involves giving of ourselves in a variety of ways, um, uh, giving spiritual help, giving emotional help through companionship, encouragement, and correction, as well as physical help, material help. I was going over this in between services, and as I came to this point in, the, in my notes, I thought of a book that I had just read uh, by John Le Carre, one of his latest spy novels. I read him periodically, and in fact, I've referred to him more than once, and I, I'm working ahead in my studies, so you'll probably hear another illustration or quote from him. He's an interesting man, um, secular man. In fact, he's on the 
left wing of politics in Britain, but he's an articulate writer. In fact, I want to say brilliant writer, but I'm not perhaps one to be able to make that judgment, but he, he is a very articulate writer and has very insightful things to say. And so that's why periodically I've quoted him, but in this book, he's the leading character meets this young man there in the same club together, and they develop a relationship, and the young man's kind of undisciplined in some ways. And this character makes this statement. He said, the greatest thing that an older person can give to a younger person is his time. And I thought, that's absolutely true. We, as, as believers, can help one another in a variety of ways, and the circumstances will determine that, but we can't give anything more valuable to anyone than our time. And an older person, particularly, can share with the younger people. That's something for all of us to think about, I think. That's one way we express our love. And when we talk of love, we do have to talk about affection, I say it's not basically emotion. I don't think it is. I don't think it's basically feeling. That's, I, I mention that because that's really the way love is thought of today. Uh, it's something that carries us along, some uh, wonderful feeling that we have for someone. But I do think that is part of, of, of love. It, it is an affection, and we're to have that affection for all. And that's, I mention that because sometimes that's very difficult, isn't it? We are still sinners trying to love sinners. But as we see them as they are, that is, as we see them as the Lord sees them, as we see them as those for whom Christ died, those for whom He loves, those whom the Father loved from all eternity and chose to be His children, then it, it should become easier. And He adds at the end that they were to practice this love just as we also do for you. Paul wasn't asking them to do something that he didn't do. And I have to say, I probably do that with you all you know, very often. Based on what the scriptures say, I'll say we need to do this or that. And I say, well, you know, are you doing that? Well, Paul did the things that he instructed them to do. He practiced what he preached. Paul loved the brethren, all of them, and he sacrificed for them. And he certainly sacrificed his time for them. I can imagine uh, the, the times that he spent with Timothy and Silas and the others as they were traveling from place to place. He certainly spent a lot of time with those Ephesian elders and when they meet in Miletus and say their farewell to Paul, knowing they'll never see his face again. They fell on his neck and they wept. Because this man had devoted so much of his life to them personally, sacrificed for them. So if we, if we need a real example of love, they, they had that and we have that in Paul who was, has told them all that he did for them. He's told them in this letter how he treated them like a loving parent. He burdened himself so as not to be a burden to them. He did everything for them without seeking personal gain or earthly reward. He was selfless and sacrificial. That is what should overflow to all believers and even flow out to those outside the church and for all people, Paul says. And I think there he means unbelievers. There are many, many things that the world, the world should know us for. Uh, it should know us for our honesty and integrity. It should know us for our knowledge. We should know what we believe and be able to defend it before the world. That's, that's Peter's exhortation in 1 Peter 3 for verse 15. To be able to defend the hope that's within you. Can you do that? I have to ask myself that question. But above all of that, not in place of it, but above it is love. Jesus told his disciples that it was by our love for one another that the world would know us. Paul prayed for that, which means he asked God to cause it to occur within these Thessalonians, to give it to them, which again infers God's sovereignty. Love comes from him. 
We can't generate it ourselves. We can't stir it up within ourselves. It's a gift of God. I say that because of what Paul says in Galatians 5 verse 22. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The first aspect of the fruit of the Spirit is love, then joy, then peace, long-suffering, all these virtues that he lists, but the first is love. It comes from him. It's a gift from him. He sovereignly disposes of it. Now that, that, by the way, is a great proof of God's existence, the love that exists within us. His work within us is a great proof that He's real. And it was seen in the Thessalonians in an amazing way when they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That was a, a stunning testimony to the people of Thessalonica. In fact, it was so effective that Satan tried to prevent it and stop it by bringing a wholesale persecution against that small congregation at Thessalonica. Because it was so effective. It's a work of God. David Brainerd witnessed the same among the Indians to whom he ministered who were very much like the Thessalonians. He, he wrote of it in his journal. I think it's very moving what he, what he wrote. I know of no assembly of Christians where there seems to be so much of the presence of God, where brotherly love so much prevails, and where I should take so much delight in the public worship of God as in my own congregation. Although, not more than nine months ago, they were worshiping devils and dumb idols under the power of pagan darkness and superstition. Amazing change, this, he writes affected by nothing less than divine power and grace. There's a Calvinist for you. Then he writes, this is the doing of the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. That's what the sovereign God does, and what he can do and does do, and what he can do for us. We're responsible to love. But it is, is God, it is God who must supply if we're not abounding in love, we may wonder if God is working among us. So we must pray for it. We must go to the source of it and seek it and then practice it. If we don't, we're without excuse. Verse 13 in Paul's third prayer, he shifts from the present to the future and the return of Christ, he wanted the Thessalonians to be prepared for it, not to get caught up in the world and neglect that and be caught unawares, as it were, when the Lord returns. So abound in love, he said, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. The word establish is the same word in verse 2, strengthen. We are established when we are strengthened in our heart, in our inner life, in our thoughts and our will and our emotions. And we are strengthened by love. That's what Paul was saying. He prayed that they would abound in love so that he may establish their hearts. Love does that. It's, it's the product of sanctification, but it also is part of the work of sanctification. It has that sanctifying effect, not, not only on our love for others, but principally uh, our love for the Lord. Now that's, I think, what he's speaking of here, for both. But principally, it must be our love for the Lord. We want to please Him in view of all that He's done for us. Love for the Lord and for His people puts Him and them first. As William Hendrickson put it, it causes us to be less prone to crave the unseparated life. In other words, less prone to crave an, an integrated life with the world, a, a worldly fleshly life is what he's speaking of. The separated life is the holy life. In fact, that really is what holiness is essentially. That's the basic meaning of the word holiness in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament. It's separation. It's also dedication, separation to dedication. As the Lord's chosen ones, He separated us from the world. 
and not only separated us from the world, taken us out of it as it were, but separated us to himself. This word saints is from the word holiness. So believers are holy ones, separated ones, dedicated ones. And by praying that they would be without blame in holiness, he was praying that they would live up to their position, that their lives would conform to what they were. They're saints. They're holy ones. Now live according to what they are is what they were to do and what we're to do. Every believer has been called out of the world. And every believer has been justified, declared righteous. And now we're to live up to that. We are to be blameless in our behavior because while we're saints, we're sinning saints. And we need to live more as saints. We are to aspire to that. And love leads to that. And so we should all hope to abound in love for the Lord and for one another. We do that by thinking about Him. We do that by filling our mind with the kinds of doctrines that fill the Apostle's mind that he expresses in verse 11. We do that by following Paul's counsel from Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, for example. Setting our minds on the things above, not the things that are on earth. We do that by thinking of who He is and what He has done for us. Thinking of His love for us and the, the sacrifice for us that He made and the constant guidance and protection of us that He gives. That is sanctified. It leads to holiness. That's what Paul prayed for. A life without blame. That's a high standard for a, a person. Be blameless. Now, we're to be blameless people. We're, we're to strive for that. We're to be concerned about that. They were to have that as our, our object and goal. We are to, to be that before the world. More importantly, we're to be that and live that way before the Lord. That's the, the stable, well-established life. Timothy had been sent to the Thessalonians to encourage that, Paul said back in, in verse 2. But again, here he reveals that the ultimate source of our strength and stability and holiness is the Lord. He's praying to the Lord to give that. He's the source of it. This is the powerful, transforming power of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who, who changes us. He's sovereign in our spiritual development. And so we should pray for that to take place, for that change in us. One of the incentives for our wanting a changed life, a holy life, a life of obedience and one that is abounding in love and practicing it is the fact that we do live before God. He knows all. He sees all. Nothing that's going on in you right now escapes Him. He knows what's on your mind, on your heart, where your thoughts are going at this very moment. He knows all. So that's a motivation to be living a life that's in conformity to the image of Christ. But this, this last statement that Paul makes and the reason for his prayer also gives incentive to obedience. Christ is coming again. And Paul wanted them to be found unblemished at his return. He wanted them to be without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. This is a major theme of this book, 1 Corinthians, the return of Christ. He, evidently, in the few weeks that he spent with them in Thessalonica, two, maybe three, he emphasized eschatology, future things, quite a bit with them. And here he is going back to it that they be found without blame when Christ returns. The Lord's return then has a, has a sanctifying influence on us. It, it gives us hope in a life that's often without, seemingly, humanly speaking, without hope. But we have this hope. He's coming. And He's going to conquer. He's sovereign. And He will triumph. So we should live for Him and we should live for the kingdom to come. 
And negatively, we don't want to be found not living for him when he does return, living for the world, living for self, yielding to the evil one, to the enemy. Paul didn't want that. So he tells them, in effect, live for eternity, not for time. Live for the future, not for the moment. Christ can come at any moment. Paul believed that. He didn't know if he would come in his lifetime. He had that hope. Every generation has that hope. That's, that's all that he means here. But should he come, Paul wanted the Thessalonians to be ready for it, active and obedient. It's what we should want for ourselves. That's what he prayed for the Thessalonians. It's what we should pray for one another and for ourselves. We should be praying the same things the apostle prayed for, for love to increase in us individually and among us as a church, and that we be longing for and looking forward to the Lord's imminent return. John prayed for that at the end of the book of Revelation. After unfolding the great events that will take place in the future, John prays, come Lord Jesus. We should pray that. That will be our prayer and our desire. That's what we should pray that the Lord will make. That we would have that desire. And I think that it's, if we pray that, God will give that. After all, as Paul said, He's our Father. And our Father gives good things to us. Now, Paul wasn't the originator of that expression, our Father. Jesus was. He instructed His disciples to address God in prayer that way, which was unheard of at the time of individuals referring to God as our Father. But that's Matthew 6, verse 9, our Father who is in heaven. Because He is our Father, He gives good gifts to His children when they ask. So we should ask. Prayer changes things. It's God's means of bringing about change of giving us His good gifts. That's how we obtain them. We lay hold of them. James wrote in James 4, verse 2, you do not have because you do not ask. Now that doesn't mean prayer changes God's decree. It doesn't mean that by prayer we bend His will to our will. It means that through prayer, God carries out His decree. He's absolutely sovereign. And that's, again, the only reason we can pray to Him. The only reason it makes sense to pray to Him. He's sovereign. He's able. And that should encourage prayer, not discourage it. But so often, we don't pray. Even we Calvinists don't pray. The reason? We don't really believe prayer accomplishes much. If we did, we'd pray. And we'd pray earnestly, like Brainerd, like the Apostle Paul. And prayer does accomplish a lot. We know that from the Word of God. We know that from James, who encourages that. He said, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Change the weather. That's what Elijah did, and that was, that's, that's James' great example of that. Well, may God increase our prayer life in 2020 and our desire to live for Him. I began with David Brainerd praying in the snow. I'll, I'll end with something he said that applies to all of this. He said, I love to live on the brink of eternity. He always did. He died of consumption at the age of 29, but he lived his short life with eternity before him, believing that our hope is real, and that our future is glorious and certain. That guided him, motivated him to live obediently for what lasts for eternity. May God, who has set eternity in our hearts, in the hearts of all of us, may he stir up that knowledge of and interest in eternity and the hope that we have, the hope of his return, so that we would live for him and live for what lasts. If you're here without Christ, may God put eternity in your thoughts because we're all bound for an eternal existence, either in light or in darkness, in joy or in grief, in bliss or in pain. 
realize this, the end will come. Either when Christ comes or when your brief life, like a candle, burns out. Then eternity. Come to Christ. He is God. He's God the Son. He's the Savior whose sacrifice removes all of the sins and the guilt of all who believe in Him. Trust in Him. He forgives and He receives all who do. Then live for Him. Abound in love. God help us to do that. Let's stand and sing hymn number seven in the song. Father, we do pray that you give us a clearer vision of you, and we've been given a good one in our passage in verse 11, the triune God who is personal, who loves us, is absolutely sovereign, in whose confidence we can rest. We pray that you would bless us with a deeper understanding of yourself. We thank you for the love that you have shown us in your Son in sacrificing him for us and obtaining salvation for us that we could never obtain for ourselves. Thank you for him. Thank you for Christ. And it's in his name we pray.